Man, I should send some. Testing. I should send a bunch of pictures down to your store to sell them. Hey, we all get up. paid, man. <laughs> Take that whole thing from Newark and put it in. Beautiful Test stuff. it first. Just, can you guys hear me? Yeah, we, yeah, can, we can hear you. you. You're good. Can okay, you perfect. Me? Nice. Because I don't have me? headphones. They should no. be able to hear you. Can you noise. Me? We can hear you perfectly. I'm not too loud, too close, too far. <laughs> You're good. perfect, sir. Amazing. Perfect. Sound check. Legend right now. Check, 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 check. <laughs> can okay. we call you Ernie? I told you. Be a Travis, be a Travis you don't call, call me. Come on. Come on. Come on. I should learn. I should learn. They call me. They call me. They call me brother. I was on Hot 97 a, a few months ago. Oh, I'm oh sure yeah, we saw that. Yeah, yeah, yeah we I saw that. that. And and that was sweet because, you know, I didn't know them people, and they treated me like I was their cousin or their uncle, so I thought that was sweet. Mm -hmm. But uh, that sister, I forget her name. She's, 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 All right. You know what it is, Ernie? Okay. You, you, for a lot of us, not them, because they're young, but for a lot of us, it's something you, uh, uh, Uncle Ralph, you have this thing where it's like you're part. You are part of this culture. Yeah, we so, like we like the uncles. We like the yeah, older you know, uncles. Yeah. Listen, I, I want to tell you a story. Yeah. When I worked in the club, okay. When I when you when I first started seeing you, I was just a promoter. When I started actually doing my parties and doing doors, it was like an unspoken thing. If he showed up or Uncle Ralph, we call him Uncle Ralph, Ralph McDaniel. Yeah, yeah. He did a, a video show thing called yeah. Video Music before MTV. He was doing all the hip-hop yeah, stuff. Before we didn't have that. that. He, he wasn't doing no hip-hop. Mm. We, we used to stay up late, watch video music about it. You know, <laughs> see who was on and whatnot. Right. But these guys would walk in, and it was like, you don't Aww. stop them. Just let them in, because they... Well, number one, number one, they knew we wasn't going to drink. Number two, we knew they knew we wasn't going to fight. Number three, they knew we wasn't going to mess with nobody's woman. Number four, we wasn't going to be sniffing and, you know, doing all that stuff in the back. Yep. We came there to work and to document, and and that's what allowed us that grace. Also, uh, as you know, a lot of the brothers on the door were from the Nation of Islam, and Minister Farrakhan had told them early on, that's our brother. That's our brother. And you treat him like you would treat your own father and your own brother. So when I used to go into the club, they had these humongous guys there at the door, <laughs> and they wasn't letting nobody in, and mm. they would hug me, give me the greedy peace, you know, mm -hmm. and say, as-salam, wa mm -hmm. and I would oh. say, wa alaikum as salam <laughs> and I'd get in, and all night, and all night, and KRS was at my house recently, and he said, he was looking at pictures all day, Cheese knows about all the pictures, he's, KRS is sitting there with me, and he says, you know what impressed me about you, brother? I said, what? I, I didn't know. He says, I saw you in the clubs 3, 4 o'clock in the morning. You got $3,000 worth of cameras. The whole room was filled up with stick-up boys, and nobody's <laughs> trying to yeah. stick you up. <laughs> he said, I could never figure me, him and D-Nice and, and Miss Melody and a bunch of them, they'd be like, they'd, they'd just be watching, waiting to see me get stuck up. You know, they said, we got your back. If you get stuck up, we got you, you know. Uh -huh. But they said, we never saw you get stick up, stuck up. And even when you go outside the club and walk three blocks to your car, nobody messed with you. I said, you know why? You said it in one of your songs. When you walk, walk with authority. Tell the negative people, don't bother me. Yeah. Mm. I like that. Yep. Thank you, brother. All right, you, you guys ready? Yes, we are ready. Test test you. you have your test? Right. Testing. Test, Everything's test, working. Test, test, okay, and your what? Okay. Intro? Yep. I can hear you. Intro you're good. Uh, I can. What happened? Don't worry happy. about the camera. What, what's going on? I, I switched from that. We're using, we're using without. Mm -hmm. Without her. Okay. Without Claude. Okay. We're going to come into our topic. Baby, baby. Oh, this one. Everything I do is gonna be funky.
Good morning, and thank you for tuning in to County Prep Radio. We are your hosts, Hanan, Charlize, and Paul Jor. And we're here today with a legendary photography photographer, and it would be a tragedy if I did not call him His Majesty, <laughs> Ernie Panicoli, <laughs> a.k.a. Brother Ernie. This guy appeared in a variety of books and magazines, uh, most notably Vibe, Rolling Stone, New York Times. Mm -hmm. And has also worked on two very reputable books on hip-hop known as Hip-Hop at the End of the World and Who Shot You. To add on, he was also inducted in the Hip-Hop Hall of Fame in 2014. So, Brother Ernie, how are you today, sir? I'm good. Every day above ground is a good day. I agree, I <laughs> so agree. True. Absolutely. Um, we have a bunch of questions, mostly when students found out you were coming in, they were really interested. Uh, I think just now, I don't know if anybody else felt this, but just now when you walked in, there was a sense of familiarity. Yeah. And I, I, when I researched, when I did my research, everybody that's ever talked to you said the same thing there's always a sense of familiarity even if it's the first time talking to you why do you think people feel that well uh, that's a good question i think it's because i don't see any division between us i don't see uh me as as me and him and they you know it's we and like they say in the street we are we got <laughs> I, that, that's great. That's a great lens to look through. You know, I was looking at your life growing up, did a little research on how you grew up in Brooklyn. And, you know, it said that you left the house at a young age to take care of your family. How did you learn such selflessness at such a young age? Wow, that's... Well, first, one of the things that you have to do is not look back too much because mm -hmm. as you get older... Uh, you're supposed to get wiser and stronger and blah, blah, blah. But the truth is, you gotta, you, if you look where, you know, creator put your nose, he put it on the front of your face and your eyes. So that's for you to walk forward. So you try not to look back too much. And there's two different uh, uh, schools of thought. One is that we have a destiny. Uh, people in, the, in Asia believe that we are reincarnated and we have to pay for what we did right and wrong. And we get blessings from what we did right, and we have to uh, atone and and transcend what we did wrong. Um, so some of it is written when you're born. Uh, I'm sure in Islam they talk about, you know, uh, there's even an American poet who wrote, the moving finger writes and having writ moves on, and none of your piety or wit can erase even one word of it. Mm. So... Um, I don't know. That's that's way above my pay grade. I uh, <laughs> I just did what I did, and I followed my path. And I have to tell all you young people uh, two things. And if I don't say anything else, please accept these as truth. Number one, have no fear. No fear. I think the scaredest I ever was. I've been in war, been all kinds of. I I can't even tell you, but. Uh, I think the scariest I ever was was in high school because that future looked like a, a 4,000 pound gorilla, mm. you know, with big sharp teeth coming at me. And yeah. uh, I didn't know because I had no connections, no money, no nothing, and no education. You know, what they gave me in high school at that time was pitiful. Uh, so uh, I think that's the most scared. Number one, have no fear. Number two, the, the the only message that I can give you is, is love and respect life. Every day I turn on the news and I see teenager A killing teenager B and mm -hmm. teenager C killing, you know, and the person who dies, their family's in, in, in traumatized and the person who lives spends the rest of his life locked up in a box. You know, come on, man. Mm -hmm. Put the guns and the drugs aside. Yeah. You have a whole future, man. You might have 50, 60, 70, 80 years out there. And and you're going to blow it because somebody stepped on your sneakers or somebody called you mm -hmm. this or that or, you know, uh, somebody looked at your girl or, you know, somebody said something about your boy. You know, so you're going to spend the rest of your life boxed up with sweaty guys in dirty little room, a little hard bed uh, harder than this table because somebody dissed you. Come on, get past it. Mm -hmm. Embrace life with all your heart. 
you know, you kind of said something that, like, you said in a previous interview with, uh, I forget what magazine, but you were talking to something, and they asked you, how do you look past your, um, when people step to you as a photographer, and, you know, they're belligerent, <laughs> drunk, and they come up to you and they go, hey, take my photo, and you go, I'd rather make three best friends than make ten enemies. That's you never right. know. That's right. I've had situations where people come up to me and they're, they're looped off or something, you know, and, uh, <laughs> you know, they tomorrow they won't remember that they stepped to me. And, you know, it, it's funny when you have that intimacy between somebody up in your face. Mm -hmm. You know, you have a lot of choices. You can run, you can fight, you can, you know, I'm trained in martial arts, there's a whole bunch of stuff. <laughs> but why? Why? That person's momentarily out to lunch. And if you can take and make that frown into a smile, the next time you see them, there ain't going to be no friction. That's so true, yeah. you just play it off. Say, yeah, okay, I'll take your picture. Look good. Come on. You know, <laughs> and and they're surprised because here's this big famous photographer taking pictures of them, and they feel good, man. Their boys feel good. Their their girl feels good. And, and you made some friends. So next time you're in the club, it might be six months later. They remember if you were ugly, that's going to come back on you. If you were respectful and, and made fun of it, they're going to come up and laugh and say, thanks, man. You know, it doesn't hurt to, to be nice, man. Hmm. It really doesn't. And, yeah, uh, I'm a little bit older. I got, you know, but please, man, it's always been like that. Gotcha. Um, so you've mentioned a lot about the Islamic faith, uh, and especially in the hip-hop industry, a lot, of, um, a lot of them are Muslims. And you mentioned being grateful I was thinking yesterday. I was I was talking with a friend, and they were asking me if, if everything you were grateful for was to still be today. Would you have all of that? Like, are you always grateful for what you have? Is that a big part of your life? I woke up this morning. I'm grateful. I'm 75 years old. I don't look or act or feel 75, but you get up in the morning, and the first two words out of your mouth have to be thank you. Mm -hmm. Last two, even if you had the worst, crappiest day in your whole life, your last two words at night got to be thank you. Because tomorrow, you have a chance to get it right. I know people have been trying to get it right for <laughs> forever. <laughs> but, you know, you, man, the, 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 it seems like the world is, ha is having a, a love affair with, with death and having a love affair with hurting each other. I'm going to blow up your town. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to take over your country. Uh, you know, my gang is going to take over. You know, uh, we're going to sell more drugs. And, you know, it's like we're hell-bent on a mission. And really, if you just try to think six months, a year out into the future, which choice would you take? If you had a choice to go back and still hurt that person or be hurt by that person, okay, we don't have that choice to correct anything we've done right or wrong or, or any harm we've had, but we do have the choice to avoid those situations. If you could take a frown and turn it into a smile, if you could get somebody to keep from hitting you and instead hugging you, or somebody that when they see you, they give you a thumb up, yo, brother, what's up? And that's how I flow. And I've been on the East Coast, the West Coast, the Bloods, the Crips. We used to have a, a, a thing, and Dougie Fresh was part of it, uh, where we'd get the gang members together, the leaders, and have them sit down. And some of them had killed other people's family. Wow. And we sat down, and the first year it was kind of scary. And the second year, we were able to put the, the two the two gangs together wow. instead of, you know, one on the left, one on the right. And, uh, you know, we got a whole bunch. Right, right now, you all got uh, a 10,000-pound armed gorilla coming at you, and, and that's this environment. You saw Florida? You saw Pakistan? Yeah. You know, in America, they don't talk about Pakistan. It's something over there. It's some, you know, 
if you look at the the the, the I, I forget how many millions of people or hundreds of thousands of people were killed, houses washed away in Florida. You know, Absolutely. and and you worried about what color shirt you're wearing, or mm -hmm. or you know, he said this, or they said that, or, or you know, man, you got a ten thousand pound gorilla coming at you a thousand miles an hour. You better get on your good foot, and don't tell me about electric electric cars are a scam, and ain't nobody going to tell you. Where do you think they get the electricity from that runs those electric cars? They get it from fossil fuel. Come on, check it out. Think. Think that's why the crater gave you this big lump of gray stuff on above your head, above your neck. Where's the where's the fuel coming from? Where's the electricity coming from that you're gonna go to these electric stations and and get electricity? Where's it coming from? Don't take my word for nothing. I might be delusional <laughs> or crazy. Look it up. And right now, actually for the past hundred years, they've had alternative fuels. Mm-hmm. They have alternative technologies. But when oil companies and drug companies run the country and the planet, you ain't going to do nothing to interfere with them. They're living good. They're big pimping. <laughs> and here you're going to come and say, well, you know, I know if I studied a little bit of biology and I understand a little bit about science, and if you take a little bit of hydrogen and, and, and just move two molecules this way, you you could run a, a a steamship for six months on the oh, 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 all of a sudden he was hit by lightning it was a clear day you know mm -hmm. or he fell off the roof and he was in the basement that's kind of you know the mathematic look it up so you all got a ten thousand pound gorilla coming at you at a thousand miles an hour you better find a resolution to that and and all this war and invading other people's country. We're not in the Stone Age anymore. Mm -hmm. And when voting comes, vote. Because people sacrificed That's and right. died for the right to vote. But be careful who you vote for. And make sure that they ain't all, you know, part of the same clique. Selling the same, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the same stuff. That's interesting. That's really interesting. You know, I never thought about it from that lens of like a, you know, political stance. Mm -hmm. yeah, you can take everything and kind of de deconstruct it and go, why are we fighting? You know, that makes a lot of sense. And speaking of, you know, fighting and rivalries, in essence, how did you feel about working alongside other photographers such as Joe Conzo and uh, Jamal Shabazz? <laughs> <laughs> was it, was it like, we read that it wasn't really competitive brothers. We read that you guys deeper were deeper than brothers. Deeper than brothers. Matter of fact, both of those cats call me all the time. Uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. I'll tell you a funny Joe Conzo story. Uh, he posted some picture of Tito Puente, and he said, on a good day, Ernie couldn't take a picture like this. So I dissed him. <laughs> so we got into a the first international Facebook battle. Oh, and wow. I would show my pictures of Johnny Depp and Marlon Brando and, and, and you know, all these big celebrities, and he would show all these Puerto Ricans, and uh, we'd go back and forth. And I diss him really hard, and people would call me up, yo, man, don't be, nice. don't, don't be like that. Joe's a nice guy. Uh, Joe Kahn's is a good brother, man. Why are you dissing him? Like, why are you? I said, man, shut up. Kahn's ain't nothing. <laughs> I could take better pictures than him if I, if I had sunglasses on. Come on. <laughs> And then the phone rings, and it's Joe, and me and him are laughing hysterically. And everybody thought that we were in the middle of a battle. But Joe Conzo and Jamel Shabazz both came from the streets, both are self-taught, basically, and both have a love for their people, and that love is manifested in every piece of work that they do. So uh, people might think that there's a competition between me and Joe or me and Jamel, but those are my brothers, man. Hmm. We've broken bread together. We've hung together. We've laughed together. And, you know, uh, there was uh, one time, and I won't go into detail, where there was a situation, and Jamel Shabazz stood up for me strong. And uh, so uh, those are my brothers, man. And actually, I'm going to give you a little bit of history. 
Jamel Shabazz, Joe Conzo, and Ernie Panicoli all did a show together in Brooklyn a few years back called Three to Hard Way. And we had three walls. One wall was my stuff, one was Conzo's, and one was Jamel's. So we actually had a show together called Three to Hard Way. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, that's the only time we ever did it all together. But that, that was a powerful show. And in the back of our heads, I can't speak for them, but I'm sure that at some point we'd like to do something together. Also, if you look at our books, we all shout each other out uh, in our books. Uh, I also did the introduction for Jamel's uh, book called Back Back in the Day, uh, and uh, Conzo put pictures of me in his uh, book, Born in the Bronx, and, you know, I love those brothers. So uh, we're the three kings, and... Uh, that they mention in the Bible when Jesus was born, you know, the three kings. So that's (laughs) us. (laughs) But there's nothing but love there and respect. And uh, nobody held their hands. They just went out there and did it. And I'm super, super proud to be part of that, that, that brotherhood. That's beautiful. If you can tell us a little bit more about your identity. When you came in and I shook your hand, I noticed you're beautiful. <laughs> Why do you wear those? I know you're part you're part Native American. Yeah, but it's deeper than that. Uh, sometimes I don't wear anything. Uh, sometimes I wear a lot because I am, and this is something not well known, I'm the Supreme Minister of Culture for the Universal Zulu Nation. And we always represent when we go out uh, because the first thing people notice is, and it's not always gold or silver. A lot of time it's just beads. And they recognize that and they say, damn, that brother's on some other thing. And and that's why I do it. But uh, also uh, two things that I'm going to drop some science on you. Uh, There's two things. Metals attract magnetic forces and energies, and my hair goes all the way down my back because hair has metal in it, and it acts as an antenna. So uh, the longer you grow your hair, the more magnetism you have and the more you bring in uh, spiritual and other things. It's it's, Hair has power? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. They talked about that for a little bit in the Bible with Samson and uh, his uh, misfortune with a young lady that cut his hair. But then when he grew his hair back, he got them. So, yeah, hair, metal, metals. That's that's so, that's, I can't. I'm like so starstruck right now by you. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. I just can't. I have no words. His Majesty, His Majesty. (laughs) Uh, I was going to say, you talk about, actually, Zulu Nation was one of the first people that you photographed. That's what you said in one of your interviews. And, um, you know, what made them your first image? And they had a very, like, I was going to ask, what made them your first image? And what made them so influential to you to have that, what is it, Afrocentric style to them? Yeah, but the... Spirit is even deeper. If you realize, we had nothing. The kids in the Bronx and Brooklyn and Queens, we had nothing. Most of us didn't have a father. Most of us didn't have any money. Most of us, unfortunately, didn't have any hope. And then hip-hop came, and and people tell me, uh, spoiler alert, People come and they say, uh, oh, hip-hop started in 73 with Cool Herc or 74 with Cool Herc. That's No, nah, no, nah, no. Nah. Not not to take anything away from my great brother. I love Herc. We've spared, shared so many wonderful times together. Hip-hop's always been there. Whether you call it bebop or you call it soul or whether you call it whatever or Blues. even when the slaves were in the fields, uh, Picking cotton, 
when uh, natives were hunting, you know, we always had a song on our lips. We had a song in our heart. We had a magic. We had a majesty. We had original man. And that has always been with us. And it manifested again as hip hop. And then it got uh, diluted. And, and the garbage now that they call hip hop is not hip hop because hip hop elevates. You know, you can't go into, uh, walk down a flight of stairs and say that's an elevator. That's that's a staircase. Yeah. So if if hip hop comes from the people, and is put there by creator to raise the people, and it lowers the people, that's not hip hop. I don't know what that is. You call it whatever you want. Hip hop is an organic spiritual energy. Not to be confused with religion, which is the study and practice of a religion. This is an organic spiritual thing, and I could tell you stories, and and I've never shared so many of these stories, of the miracles that I've seen through hip hop and life changing effects of hip hop and brotherhood and sisterhood. So that's what drew me to the universal Zulu nation, and unfortunately now so many of our brothers and sisters are gone because. Uh, Time takes them out. Everybody has a certain amount of time. And their time is up. And, you know, you have to ask, what is your generation doing? What is your generation creating? What is your generation sharing? What is your generation, how are they digging into the soul, the essence, the God of who you are and making something new and valuable and beautiful? I don't mean just something that's on a record or on a movie screen or dance, but how are they they taking this universal energy and using it to, at this point, again, I talk about that 5,000-pound gorilla that's coming at you. Mm -hmm. What are you doing? Are you believing the lie that we need electric cars? Are you believing the lie that this and that and this and no? Are you looking past that? And you're not going to tell me you don't have people with all kinds of science degrees that are looking past all this? And, and saying, wait a minute, we have in, in California, I, I think a month ago, it was 120 degrees mm-hmm. in L.A. 120 degrees, it's usually 87 degrees there. Yeah. And that's this year. Next year, it's going to be 147 degrees. What, 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 what is your generation doing? What are... What, before let, let let me let me put this down real real flat. Before you come up with an answer, you have to come up with a question. Right. And if something's kicking you in the behind, then you know what the question is. How do I get that thing to keep from killing me? Yeah. How do I get that from keeping killing my kids? How do I get it from destroying my cities? How do I get it from destroying my planet? So that's the question. Mm. Are you answering that question? Or are you distracted about 800 other things? Mm. Well, you know, I, I won't even go into that aspect of it. But the thing is that we, we need your generation or the people who are going to inherit this earth have inherited this earth. Right. We shamefully did not give you <laughs> a good planet. We, we messed up. Mm. But each generation is their duty, it's their responsibility as human beings, to ask the questions and find the answers. A few years ago, I went all over the country, all over the world, and I did lectures, sometimes for three hours. And I would always ask, especially when I went to these uh, Harvard or Yale or uh, New York University, I would ask the the tech people and, and the professors, I would say, yo, I got a question for you. Where do you see this? And I'd hold up my phone or my laptop and say, where do you see this in 10 years? And there was not one that could give me a good answer, but they all said something very similar, which is that it will be biological at some point, that they will mix technology and and biological. Mm. We'll, We'll go into some kind of a cyborg thing, you know. And and even now, uh, I get on the pad train, which is very rare, but if I get on the pad train, you'll see 100 people sitting down and 100 people playing with their phone and nobody looking around and learning about the people around them. 
and not communicating with the people around them and not building with the people around them and not even observing the people around them. Do you think that's like the one of the main issues of the generation? I, I think it's one of the weaknesses of weaknesses. the generation. Got it. Because many of you don't know how to tie knots to keep <laughs> yeah. things from slipping away. Mm -hmm. And and I say that physically and metaphorically. And it's not your fault. It's what you were given. And I'm not knocking the technology. I use it better than anybody. I have, uh, at any given time, five or six shows around the planet, and it's all because of technology. But underneath the technology, it's a scary time and I don't have the answers. I'm barely able to form the questions, but you all, if you're not, if you don't consider yourself magical, then at least you should begin to create or give birth to the questions. I think something that you've brought up that I find really interesting is asking the question. When I look around and with the idea of social media, we so rarely ask questions. We like when you're sitting in it, <laughs> we really rarely ask questions. We kind of just follow what's been given to us. And it's like a real, like a terrible thing. I think. Yeah, I, I think it's one of the biggest issues we have as a generation that we're being told to follow the things that were given to us. I think now we're beginning to ask questions with all that's going on, like climate change, about more than 30 million people were displaced in Pakistan. And 30 million. Yeah, more than 30 displaced lost their homes. And my heart goes out to them. But I think when you don't see any of that on the news, not even no, not sir. even five sure. seconds on the news, no, not even five seconds. But they'll give Kanye uh, hours and hours of, of dribbling. But I, I did not even know the magnitude uh, of of the disaster, and uh, if we stop looking at Pakistan as Pakistan and look at it as our planet, yes, our sir. brothers, our sisters, human beings on this earth, then our perspective changes. Instead of over there, it's an over there problem, or this or that. We have to start looking at those places, those people as us. Yes. Once it's your mother, your cousin, your grandmother, all of a sudden the mathematics changes. Yeah. It's all different. Yeah. It's and, all. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, sorry, yeah. So about spirituality, I was watching a bit of, uh, I believe you've made like a spoken word. on. It's on YouTube. It's called Thank You. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I have a bit of. Man, yeah. if you if you knew the story about that, it involved the Beatles. Oh, the Beatles. Wow. The Beatles. How are the a, Beatles connected? <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you how it happened. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it involved a, a devotional singer from Tibet who left Tibet oh, by wow. climbing over the Himalayan mountains with her baby on her back. Wow. Okay, it involved a drummer from Morocco. Mm. It involved a guitarist from Liverpool who brought me to Liverpool and brought me to the home of the Beatles and so on. I, you know, uh, I, I have a story that hasn't really but... What were you asking me about? Thank you. Thank you. Oh yeah, no, because it was just um a quote that I want to like uh, rephrase. It was, it's all connected. All the energies, the music, the art, the water, the sky, the earth, the animals. I could walk into a field with animals, and animals come to me. Can you like uh, elaborate on that? Because I really like that quote. If it's one of my favorites. if you feel other than the energy around you then the energy around you will feel other than about you. If you feel, if if you walk into a place with a purity and innocence, yeah. people hug you. I can't explain it. I'm not, you know, I, I just know that that energy is at the core of who we are. We're on this earth for one reason and one reason only, and that's to evolve. Mm to be tested and evolve. Think about what I'm saying. They tell you 5,000 reasons you're on this earth to make money, to have babies, to, to build buildings and you know have hit records. You're on this planet to evolve. I don't care what your religion is. I don't care what your politics are. I don't care what race you are. 
you're on this planet to evolve, to grow and evolve as a human being, and at some point merge with the spiritual. Because if you really look at an x-ray of a person, we're all the same. Yes. Mm, true, yeah. What you can't see is the spirit. What you can't, and the only way you hear it in their voice, and it touches you. That's the, that's the part they haven't found the technology to find yet, okay? Because that's technologic. Uh, one of my great teachers told me uh, technology means tech, no logic. No logic. That's, yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. And once you get into technologic, you become technologically tilted a certain way. What you have to do is you have to find a way to get past the techno logic, get into the logic, get into the spiritual. And I am not going to sit here and tell you this religion, that religion, this this practice, that practice, yoga or eating kelp or, or kale. No. It's a quiet thing, man. And we all have that quiet time. And we have to find, we have to investigate that quiet time. Yeah, and along with like a spirituality i remember i believe i was on spotify and i searched up your name it was a playlist that i found it was spirit of hip-hop elements by i believe uh david strickland in in toronto yeah and the intro it's called elements i believe you're part of it it was like spoken word i believe and i would just like to play a little bit of it sure quick. yeah Beautiful piece. it was really nice spirit of hip-hop not only the four elements of hip-hop but the most important element of hip-hop which is knowledge wisdom and understanding that's the fifth element the fifth element is a cultural one of knowledge and that's what we need to do and this is not just words because words and spirit without actions it's just sound That's a that's like a beautiful way that you defined how everyone's all kind of together and similar. I think. Yeah. I, I really like your spoken word of elements. And I was gonna ask one more question that you said on Hot ninety seven capturing hip hop history. You said, "I was one of the people who helped define the look and feel of hip hop." What is that to you? I I you never. create change consciously and you never create change you're not aware of it as you're doing it but you have to understand the world is different now now you go to a concert before the concert is five minutes in the whole planet has already seen it because everybody's ig and all over the place like monkeys and no for real and Back then, nobody knew what the artist looked like. That's why MF Doom wore a mask. He says there was a time, and Chuck D from Public Enemy said it also. He said uh, nobody knew or cared what we looked like. They knew what we sounded like because sound goes into your ear. Mm. And I was one of the cats that helped create the look of hip-hop. That, that's what I meant by that, is that we uh, shared the visuals. And a lot of people didn't know what Roxanne Chante or Salt and Pepper or Kwame or anybody looked like. But then because of the magazines, because of what we were doing, all of a sudden people were like, Oh yeah, now now I know you know what Bismarck Key looks like. Mm -hmm. And and by the way, I'm gonna put in a plug for B Bismarck we Key who we just lost. Yeah. We just lost Lo Lobroskowski. We just mm -hmm. lost uh <sighs> So many brothers and sisters, it's crazy. Uh, we peace. lost Eskasi from uh, Houdini. Uh, we lost Coolio. Uh, I, I have to tell you guys, if you want to see one of the greatest moments of hip-hop in your life, uh, go and look at Bismarck Key doing Benny and the Jets. Uh, live Letterman, David Letterman, Benny and the Jets. You have to watch it physically. It's pure genius. It was so genius that it, 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 it will take your breath away. Yeah, Benny and the Jets. Benny and the Jets, Elton John? Elton John actually wrote to him, sent him a telegram, 
saying it's the most brilliant interpretation of one of the songs ever. Mm. He he was on, uh, I think he was live on Letterman, and it's the most brilliant thing you've ever seen in your life. I, I'm going to tell you a joke about Bismarck. He, uh, rest in peace, my brother. Me and him used to have a lot of arguments, man. He was like, mm. oh, God. <laughs> Biz was so brilliant. One night we were at a club and these two guys started fighting. They were beating the hell out of each other, right? And Biz was the DJ. He started putting on cartoon music. So every time they, <laughs> wow. they'd hit their... <laughs> so the more they fought, the louder he put the cartoon music and they actually had to stop the fighting because the, the music was so funny. He put <laughs> Saturday morning cartoon music on. And it stopped these knuckleheads from beating each other. That's amazing. That's so, that's. That's biz. That's like one of the ways that you stop a fight is yeah. you make it comical. Yeah, I've me, seen that. me and biz had a lot of fights. He was always messing with me. And he, you know, but there was always underneath it an undercurrent of love and humor. I remember once I went into the VH1 Awards and I walk into this room and every celebrity is in the room and I just walk in real quietly. And he's the DJ, and he puts a spotlight on me in front of, you know, 3,000 people. And he says, Brother Ernie, you got my pictures? Where's my pictures? He started messing <laughs> with me. <laughs> you have no idea how to feel. Wow. You're walking in trying to be cool, and, and Biz is riding you. Oh, man. But it's uh, all love, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I get that. Yeah. I have brothers. I have fathers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Biz Marquis. We lost so many so soon, uh, and that leads me to my last point, and that's that you must, you absolutely must appreciate every second you're here, every second. You must. You know, I have a question about your books that you have featured photography in. Um, well, I have 12. <laughs> you, you don't know. If you go to lulu.com, I did a book on punk. Punk? Lulu.com, punk. I did one on graffiti called, I call it graffiti. Uh, the one I did on punk is called Punk Life. Oh, wow. Okay. And and there's a whole bunch more, but uh, what was your question? I was going to say, like, when you made those images and that, and that, like, you have your iconic, you know, Biggie in the car on this side. You have your other pictures with, um, I forgot their names. It was those girls you told them to like sit down on a bed, like, kind of like laying down, they're cupping their faces, and your ass, and you yeah, told them- Yeah, that was salt and pepper. Salt and pepper, there you go. Yeah. And um, you, know, you told them to like lay down and look at the camera as if they were talking to one of the girls. I wanted to know what your thought process behind telling all these people, did you have different analogies? Like, did you tell Biggie, look as if you're looking at, some, at like your worst enemy or something? I don't know. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of tricks. Uh, actually, if you go to Sears, the department store, there's a photography department, and they always have the kids like this with their, yeah. you know, the babies. Mm -hmm. yeah. And one day I was walking through Sears, and I saw that, and the next day I had to shoot salt and pepper. So I said, <laughs> why don't we do that? So I did that, and then I did Naughty by Nature, because up until then, the only time you saw Naughty by Nature, they had machine guns or hand grenades or, you know, machetes and I wanted to, they had beautiful eyes so I wanted to make them look beautiful so that's where you get influenced and affected and by everything and I got that from Sears <laughs> but guess what within a month all the magazines you you would see all these uh photographers biting my style which I bit from Sears so <laughs> mm -hmm. wow but you adapted it you made it something oh, yeah. different yeah. and you know you put your own play on it I find that magical, you know. You're able to tell someone, "Hey, look at me. Look at my look at my camera as if I'm a female, you know. Be one with me." In a yeah, sense, they have to trust you, and they have to be comfortable with you. And in order for them to trust you, you have to trust yourself. And I don't want to get too corny with you, but <laughs> every artist has a vision, and it's your submission to that vision, and your submission to that magic in you that takes you a step above and beyond the people around you. He just said a verse right there. Yeah, that write that down. <laughs> that was a rap verse. Submission to write that, that vision. Write that down, write that down. I'm stealing that. I'm going to bite that from you. 
make it make it a song i think that if we can have like all the time in the world with you i think all three of us would absolutely take that time i don't think i've learned so much with sitting with a person as much as i've learned from you genuinely i do i think it was a pleasure and an honor do you guys have any closing notes you go first pal joy well it was an honor speaking with you i'm you're an MF Doom fan. Thank you so much. <laughs> I am so starstruck by you. You've met so many yep. greats. Yep. You're one of the greats. It'd be a tragedy if I didn't end with calling you His Majesty. Majesty. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, I looked at most. No, no, some. not even most. Some. Uh, I looked at some. You looked at some. Uh, I have uh, layers and layers and layers of books that have never even, and photographs that have never been seen. Wow. Um, my, my thing is this, and... Uh, I'm not going to call anybody out, but if you're an artist, be an artist. Mm. Okay, if you're going to create, create. Don't create on Monday and then, you know, Tuesday to, to Sunday you're chilling. No, it, it has to be constant. And one of my greatest influences was uh, Miles Davis and John Coltrane. And those brothers, uh, Nita Simone, who I met, who's, who's like a goddess. Uh, my point is, if you're going to be creative, be creative all the time. You know, don't be creative sometime. And even if you, you sit down to draw or paint or write and nothing comes out, well, that nothing is what's supposed to come out. But at least reach in there. Your spirit is a well. You have to reach in there and pull it out. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Ernie Panicoli. Thank you again for meeting with us. Thank you guys for sitting in to County Prep Radio. Have a great day.